I'm taking you to this welcome to Mount Vernon sign so you can have your starting off point. It's a beautiful sign. That's it, welcome to the Mount Vernon Travel Center. You see that? All right, so well, that's enough for Christ's sake. It's a very artistic town. That's our pride and joy, is this gorilla right here. What's that shit called? The dance? <laughs> Dude, if I did that right now, my hamstring's messed up. Oh, man. Best coach in the world. As the best coach in the world, uh, how do you feel today? <laughs> okay, look, here, restart, restart, go. Being the greatest coach in the world, when you're walking around these venues, just knowing that you're better than everyone else, um, physically, mentally, uh, the way you look, the season, the impact. I've never, I've never felt like that ever. <laughs> I've never, I've never felt that the feeling. The man's so modest, guys. Don't even worry about Pretty it. Pretty right? <laughs> Nice as hair. <laughs> For us, we're not deep. You know, we'll have we'll have 16, 17 adult competitors. You know, Atos, Czech, Matt, Gracie, Baja. They might have 70 people signed up. They get third, but then that's 70 points. You know, so then we would have to nail out seven first places just to compete with that. When I was a blue belt at one of the BJJ pros, we had nine guys. We brought home 11 gold medals. So like literally everyone won, and then I won the opens, and that was the only way we could even get on the podium. We've got a lot of guys this time. I think we can we can do it this time. The gains we made from when the quarantine happened between now and then is, is fucking astronomical. I really feel like that maybe at Nogi Worlds, we thought our jiu-jitsu was what it was and it wasn't quite there yet. You know, and mentally we were tough enough and we wanted to be good enough that we believed in ourselves enough that we thought it was right there, but it wasn't. We were still in that mindset where we're a small team and we're still trying to be the big guys and trying to beat the best guys and we're not on the same playing field or like level with them, you know? And I think through the quarantine, we really bonded together as a team and understood that we're all we need to get to the top. As a team, I just think we're all just like closer. There's more of us now. There's more of us that like really genuinely believe in like winning and like how and how we do it. And like we all believe in ourselves and we all constantly are like coaching each other. It like really makes a big difference. When I first came to this place, there was only a few people in the gym. You know, it was Bird, Andrew, me, Alejandro, and it was a, a couple of stragglers that were just from around town, you know, and seeing where the team is now and the whole lineup we have and, and hearing Heath talk about it, it's just like, it would be huge to have Heath stand on top of that podium and get some recognition and seeing everyone medal and have the opportunity to even compete with these bigger teams, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it only fuels our fire to get bigger and grow as a team. I, I really can't wait. It's gonna mean everything in the world to me. Lunch time. Mount Vernon, Illinois is like, it's, it's kind of a crossroads town. There's a lot of like drug trafficking that happens here because there's like major cities, you know, Memphis is connected to Chicago and Louisville, Kentucky. So it's like all, all the Midwest cities, this is kind of almost like a meeting area. So the town's mostly just like fast food joints and you know, hotel, motel. It's a pretty simple place, but uh, we get a lot of crime, unfortunately, from you know, the interstate being right here and what comes on and off of it, so. Still a lot of stuff that we as a city need to work on. But for the most part, if you don't go looking for trouble, you know, you won't do too much find it. You know, there's like 15 or 16 blocks where just kind of the and not so nice stuff is. And that, that's, that's the neighborhood that I grew up in. You know, for me growing up there was awesome. I had a really, really great childhood. You know, we like constantly played outside. And there were like, you know, 50 neighborhood kids that you could have like pick up ball games on. I wouldn't change my childhood for too much, you know. We didn't have a whole lot of stuff, like possession-wise, but it was nice, you know, growing up like that and being able to run the streets and run around. Growing up, I was actually on the swim team, baseball team, basketball team, football team. I even was on a bowling team. We, we literally, anything that there was that they offered at any time, my mom signed us up to do it. She never missed a game. She was always there. They're extremely devoted to always being there. You know, it's kind of something that I've made sure, you know, to pass on with my boys. 
all that's unfortunately kind of gone now. Like it, it's like that with the town, you know, like the hospital that I was born in, it's been torn down. It was old. The house that I grew up in, it, it's been torn down. The high school that I went to high school at has been torn down. The, the, there's a lot of these, you know, that they, they just kind of sit and they're empty and no, no businesses will like use them. So the town's kind of like full of those. There's no any type of community building or anything like this, and there's not a whole lot for the kids to do, unfortunately. Who the fuck she fell, man? Yeah. That's what she said. I'll show you these real quick, Simone. Hey, if I tell you to stop, so... Are, oh, is someone gonna... It's okay, if I tell you to stop filming, yeah. it's because I see someone and I don't want anyone sure. to shoot into the car or anything. Oh. Okay, so that sign right there, look what it says. You buy the house for $825. There's literally hundreds of these all over Mount Vernon that are just like old, decrepit houses. Nobody does anything with them and then they get broken down. And so don't film this guy, someone that's, that's up here. So these are actually Section 8 houses, government funding house. There's a lot of these. So this is one of the local baseball fields. It's, it's not taken care of. I don't know that it'll ever be used again. So the kids can't even come up and play like pickup games on it because it's in such bad shape. And like I said, this part of town is just kind of, it's just kind of been left, you know what I mean? It's really unfortunate because down here, I don't think there's a whole lot for anybody to do. And I don't think anybody's going to change that anytime soon either. So the gym's fairly close to here. So it's like an outlet for kids to kind of go to and, and train. Some people bust their ass and work hard and they get out, but for the most part, you know, when you don't know anything different, you've seen your parents, you know, do that, and it's tough to get out of that cycle, you know what I mean? There's just not a lot of opportunity and a lot of stuff here, so I think you feel kind of stuck, and, and when you feel stuck, I think you stop, you know, moving forward in a lot of ways, and, you know, like reaching for success, and you just kind of settle, so I think that happens a lot. Are there any, like, buildings you want to eventually buy out? for like a bigger gym? There's actually a place that I'm, it used to be the YMCA. That's kind of like the goal, you know, it's in the middle of the town, it's got a nice big parking lot. We can run a wrestling and boxing program with the jujitsu. Other than that, no, not really. I mean, you know, most of the people that things are so cheap here, they invest, so they've came down and they've bought all of the stuff. So the prices have really went up so much that local people can't really afford it. So now they're just all empty buildings and run down. The old King City. You gonna tear this down too. The hospital, the houses, and the school that I grew up in. When they said that it was had of asbestos in it, they tore it down in like literally in like one day. So I mean, you know Daisy Fresh did this shit. <laughs> yeah, hopefully hopefully it gave us some superpowers and made us stronger than the other gyms, but I don't know, we'll we'll see I guess. This is about the time of day, like when I start off with the text messages, I kind of message everybody, you know, and just say, hey, class tonight, are you going to be there? And then, so we'll send out about, you know, in between 300 and 500 messages from like 11 to like 3 o'clock and make sure everybody's going to, you know, like be in class and be around. And, and that's like an everyday thing, you know. When you're trying to build something that's really significant, I think it's it's important that you become a significant part of their everyday life. So I I always message and tell them what the game plan is, what we'll be working on for the rest of the week, and that's kind of how we get it in. PSF on three, one, two, three. PSF! Yeah, dog. Yeah, dog. Breaking the law, breaking the law. Breaking the law, breaking the law. <laughs> we broke the law last night. We broke the law last night, huh? But that was just, I mean, that's what they say we did. We didn't really do that, though. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, we were going 130 in a 20. Talk a little bit about how you originally met the Pedigo guys. I met Andrew and Heath first. I had a student at this time who I had taken under my wing, and this kid was doing really well. He was winning every tournament, and we go to the Pan Ams, and here comes this kid in this little fucking 
dirty ass. <laughs> it was a white gi, but it looked like it was brown. You could tell he's all timid and nervous and shit. And I, I'm always suspect about kids like that. Kids like that are fucking dangerous, you know? I go in, and I've got Josh Vale's first round. Okay, he's at the time was the number one seed to Blue Belt. So the ring coordinator is trying to pull us out for the match, and Josh Vales is doing an interview with Gracie Magazine. He doesn't even come to the match. It takes him like five minutes to come out, and I'm like, motherfucker. So, boom, first round, Andrew just beats the fuck out of this guy. <laughs> beats his ass. I mean, just whooped his ass. I mean, just put it on him, you know? Yeah, I, I, I kind of just pummel him, like really bad. Like, I, I passed his guard, mount him, take his back, choke him. It was pretty quick. It was vicious, is a good way to put it. So then afterwards, this big, giant, scary-looking guy is fucking talking to me, puts his hand on my shoulder, and I feel like a bear just grabbed me, and he's asking me all these questions. He's like, so who, who are you? After that match, like, you know, I had spoke to Heath. Seemed like just great guys, and we exchanged some words. And then I actually went to Bear, and I said, Bear, you got to check this kid out. you got to check this kid out. And uh, sure enough, that day, he finds Andrew on Facebook, and he sent Andrew an, an instant message. I ended up getting sponsored by Show Your Roll because of Orlando. Orlando like went out of his way on his own. You know, it's rare that somebody goes out on their own, you know what I mean? Especially when you would just beat someone from their gym. You know, it just shows the kind of, you know, type of guy that the guy is, you know what I mean? It's like a lot of people think he's like a brash, you know, almost like the the WWF type guys, but look man, the, the guy's got a heart of gold. He like offers to let us stay at his gym every time we come out to California, so we would like 20 of us would sleep on his mats at his gym. He never asked for anything. He offered his home, his gym. He's just an incredible guy, man. He's done a ton of stuff. I'm forever grateful to him. I'm really glad that he's here. My dad was really into to watching sports, so he had one of those little boxes that you, kind of like the fire stick now that has all the channels. That, you got all the pay-per-views for you and shit? Yeah, let, we borrowed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, allegedly, allegedly. So I believe in like November of 93, the first UFC came on and we actually watched it. Me and my brother just kind of became obsessed with it. We just constantly emulating the moves and just go, going over them and we recorded it on, on VCR tape. So we would just watch it over and over. And even then as a kid, I remember thinking like, man, if you could just learn how to, to wrestle and sprawl and you could punch the guy, they could never get you down on the ground. So I was kind of always thinking about like that submission fighting style all the way back then. We would go to the library and get on the internet and I actually found these, these tapes, these Japanese tapes. There was a Kazushi Sakuraba instructional. So I, I just started buying all these tapes from Japan, you know, and they were really expensive at the time, you know, they were like $40 shipped, you know, when you're a kid, that's a lot. So we would like do, do anything we could to get the money to get them and save up and then we would grab them and then we would just, just do all the submission stuff and all the crazy stuff that was on the tapes. We found that so many people didn't really have anything going on, you know what I mean? So they were like happy to kind of be a part of something and that definitely played a huge role in wanting to start the gym and actual, you know, we, we did it in the grass at first, you know, so that kind of sucked, you know, who, who wants to roll in the grass, right? It's hard and it hurts. So then when he was able to rent a house finally of his own and then we had a spare bedroom and we, we, tr we trained out of that. Then we started to get like, you know, eight, 10, 12 people in, in a class and then that was kind of like where it kind of grew and, and took off. Here. <laughs> Truck. Lance is like super good people, you know. There's not enough amazing things that I can say about him. He really helped out, you know, when I wanted to kind of teach Gi Jiu Jitsu at first, you know, he was open to letting us use his barn. It's at his house. He never asked for anything, never charged anything that I tried to give him. He just always gave back. I knew Heath in high school. He, he wrestled, and I helped coach wrestling back then, so I didn't really know him, but he was one of the kids that wrestled. Actually, as far as I did, he was very scrappy. Probably some unorthodox things he was doing, wrestling-wise, that he maybe shouldn't have been doing. I would guess. Um, obviously, he was an athlete, and you know, you pick up on that quick. Yeah. So I had a barn out where I live, and my dad and I took half of it and converted it into a wrestling room. We built walls and put mats in and the other half we set up for training facilities. So he started training out in the barn. Yep. 
started out there. I don't, I don't even know. He was out there a couple years, and it's actually at my house, and it just it got to be a little much because it's where I live. I was a blue belt when I started, so everyone was brand new. They were all white belts. Like you said, they were just guys from like the weight room or wherever that we could find them from. So uh, still to this day, it's probably the nicest place that we've ever trained. There were like nice heaters in there and, <laughs> and like the air conditioner and the, the walls were matted and they were like soft mats. It was really, really nice. So we're really fortunate that Lance allowed us to, to have that there for so long. And like you said, you know, this is where he lived. So it got to where there will be you know, 15, 20 people in class. So. You know, there's just his driveway and then cars up and down the road, you know what I mean, so. There was a handful, for sure. This is it. These are the mats that were down. Yeah, here's the mat right here. There's this mat here. He had two one and a halfs. We spent a lot of time on this little guy. This is Lance's blue belt. He's been using it a lot, you can see that. <coughs> there was a guy from over at Rodrigo's that him and I drilled with a lot, and we, we had already started really experimenting really heavy with like Spider Guard and De La Riva stuff, and this is way before everybody else did. Now, I was really lucky because I, I, I have all the like new wave stuff that I stay up on, plus the, the things that I learned from him. So knowing all that stuff and be able to pass it on all to the guys where they have both worlds, I'm thankful to Rodrigo for that. We drilled a move and then we just rolled really hard for about two hours until everybody kind of like threw up and then and then that was it, you know what I mean? It was like impossible to not be in shape in the room because, you know, you just kind of felt like you were going to have a heart attack every time you rolled, even the 19-year-olds. I tell people all the time, man, you, you got the best hidden secret in, in the world right here in town. And when you're talking world champions, Pan Am champions, and these guys are so good. The neatest thing about it is a lot of them are homegrown. These are guys that he's just recruited, brought in there, and developed into what they are. There's no comparison. I mean, you see the medals on his wall in there, it's just crazy. To me, in a nutshell, that, that's success right there. It's about passion. He obviously has a passion for what he does, which is why he's so good at it. He's a very good bullshit. Yeah, how much you pay him to say that? <laughs> I just been <couldn't> noted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When we were at Atlanta's, I had some stickers left over from when I had done some MMA fights back in like 2000. A group of boys, they took them and I found them slapping them all over. And I, I just pulled up to the stop sign one day and it was there. And I told them, don't, don't be putting those on, on all the stop signs. So they're like, oh man, we put them on like 20 stop signs. So we're going to have to go around and get all of them off. That's actually the only one that I've seen in the last couple of years that went out there is because it's in the country. So. It's, it's cool, every time I drive past it, it reminds me of the good old days. Hello. What's up, dude? What's up, champ? Are you ready? Yeah. Look at the hair on this kid, man. Are you wanna go inside and say hi to your grandpa? Yeah. We're at Gail's Auto. It's my son Gavin, it's his grandfather. We're about 15 miles from Mount Vernon, so Gavin goes to a little country school out here. And uh, this is his bus stop where he gets dropped off every day and I get to come and pick him up. So I'm really thankful and appreciative of Gavin's relationship. His grandpa's an incredible grandpa and he's a really manly man, you know? He's like like mechanic and works on cars and they fish and do all this manly stuff. You know, I grew up in Mount Vernon, you know, so like, you know, we just like played in the alley and, you know, ran around with the kids. So I, I didn't really get to learn a lot of this stuff. So I'm really thankful that he has him in his life to teach him all this, you know, really, really, really cool stuff. What do you think about all of your guys in the jiu-jitsu game? You put the points on the top. I like what they're doing. Like but you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to run if he's a politician. Yeah. No, I like what they're doing up there. I like the work they're doing. It's okay to not like the jitsu. Yeah. Gotta do something now. What do you know about the gym? They're dedicated. They gotta be. Anybody that sleeps on a gym floor, and that's all them guys do. I'm a little bit different than what those guys are. You know, they train hard and do everything they can to stay healthy and me, I smoke like a train and drink when I can. And I try to get them guys to go out before. I think they'd be fun to get them out, out in the crowd someplace, but the guys are always training. Uh, you know, I'm like, hey, we're going to the lake this weekend. Oh, I can't, I've got to train. I'm like, what do you got to train for? Well, we've, we've got a match coming up. 
like take four hours out and they don't take the four hours out. There's different places around here, but none of them put out the quality of guys that Heath is. Those guys are doing it to stay fit. Heath's guys do it to be a champion at it. It's given Mount Vernon a name for something that they would have never had it for. I don't know what kind of recognition Mount Vernon actually gives them. Probably not what they deserve, just because Mount Vernon is Mount Vernon, you know. Well, how would you describe Heath as a person? Heath is a wonderful dad. You know, if you would have asked me that 13 years ago, whenever he was running around trying to make the name for himself, I thought, this guy will never be a good dad. 13 years later, I think he is. So, that's what matters. You don't want to go? I'm good. Go. If you like me, I'll do you like me. All right, baby, you ready? Yep. I'll show you how right now, how, how I do them right now. Ah. You know. Ah. <laughs> you know, I'll score on you now. All right. <laughs> my turn, my turn, my turn. That was a pass to Michael Sears. Cut that part out. <laughs> Keep it in there. All right, you want to smoke? Some smoke. Shoot it. I won't. Green. Ah, uh, throwing up them bricks, boy. We get it in about every single day. We do something every day for sure, you know. Try to spend a good two hours doing something, man. He, he probably practices more than I do, obviously. I have like two or three hours before class starts and we do homework or whatever and then we just like get it in. Like I'm really lucky, man. They're like really outside kids so they like play and you know, they're like fun. They're like old school kids, so. Oh, man. So why do you watch the one that I missed? You know, one. You know, some people make tons and tons of money, but that's something that, you know, like, time's the only thing money can't buy, so I'm just really lucky that I get to spend that, that extra time with the boys, you know, and picking them up and getting to hang out with them every day. They can't beat me. Nah. Not yet. How much do I have? I don't know. Like, six, seven. They have like 50 uncles at the gym, so I'm, I'm really lucky that they're constantly surrounded by these guys that have like dedicated their life to be great at something, and uh, I'm really happy that my boys get to see that dedication. You want to come to class tonight and do a lot of running? No, I don't want to run. My boys actually, they don't like jujitsu. They don't do jujitsu. That's my thing. If one day maybe they decide they want to do that, I'll be stoked and I'll help them out, but my only like rule for them is anything that they're gonna do, they have to try to be great. They have to you know work harder than everybody else at it. Whether it's being a painter, or, you know, a, a race car driver, whatever it is, whatever makes them happy, that's 100% cool with me. But they have to put full max effort into it all the time. So you gotta get this haircut, man. Why? It just looks a bit shit then, isn't it? <laughs> I try to take my sons to all the Major League Baseball parks. That's kind of been our thing to try to do. So when we do, I try to pick up a hat. Then I kind of got to where I like to collect and wear them to all the tournaments that we went to. And it's kind of the only thing that I've ever really collected besides geese and, you know. When do you, when you get the Atlanta one? So the, the Atlanta one's one of my oldest ones. I actually got that after an IBJJF in Atlanta. Hold on one second. Here we go. Michael, put that back there. My favorite one is probably the, the, this one up here. I got from a, a, a friend who, who's, who, who's an umpire, and then he, he hooked me up and, and got me that hat, so I was pretty excited about that. And I got two more that I, I, I got to get, and then I got the full 30, so I'm pretty excited about that. Pretty proud of this collection. These are my show your old hats, NAP hats. Yeah, this is all my fitted ones. This is one of the first ones they ever did. Those guys are incredibly amazing, man. They send stuff all the time, take care of the guys on the team, and they just constantly give, give. They never ask for anything in return. I wouldn't have been able to do 
tons of the stuff that I've, that I've done if it wasn't for their help and they really believe in the process and I can never say enough great stuff about Bear and the Show Your Old Guys. Man, they're, they're just really, really incredible. King of the Cage, hook and shoot. Yeah, when I was a kid, I would just watch these for hours and hours and hours. I have just literally a uh, hundred notebooks that are just filled from front to back. It's like mad scientist. Like, if someone looked at them, I don't even know if they could figure out the stuff that it says because it's like that. There, there's just so much stuff in them. But these are my hotel keys from the last two years from going to jujitsu tournaments. We actually stay when we go on the trips at casinos, usually if we can, because the casinos don't really pay attention to how many people are in the room. You know, sometimes we'll put 15 guys in a hotel room. It's not as bad as it once was, but uh, this is the Fairmont in Austin, Texas. 1999, Naga, North American Grappling Association, first place, a 15 and 16 year old. People laugh at this, but one of the biggest tournaments at the time was like the Naga when I looked it up. It was like the Grappler's Quest and then the Naga. So I actually took a bus. Actually, the one that you have there, I think, is about that that story a, a guy wrote. Pedigo wins North American Grappling Championship. Pedigo defeated five opponents in a 15-hour workday at the North American Grappling Championships. There were 500 competitors in 99, even back then at the... 500 competitors, yeah, because, I mean, they came from all around, because there was nothing going on, right? I'd never really been out of Mount Vernon before. That was the first time. Uh, so I took the bus 30 hours each way, and then I had to bring this really big, big trophy back when I won. He said his ambition is to one day be able to train others in the sport. I hope to one day make a life out of it and open my own school. 21 years ago. 21 years ago. Yeah. put a lot of effort into you know it's it's a building process you know what I mean so we put a lot of years in and you know now we can compete we're right there with like the major you know, Atos, Czech, Matt, Greasy, Baja. Go Bale. We had a lot of hard work up to this and it's definitely paid off. Our purple belt squad came in and fucking really killed it man. All of us got medals. Little Jacob got fucking gold. Andrew performed and kicked ass at Black Belt. It's just really cool to see all the hard work paying off. Like, you know, he always told us this was gonna happen and we always trusted him, we always believed him and it's really neat to see it all come into fruition and happening now. For Heath to get that recognition and finally be able to see that like Daisy Fresh or Pettigo Submission Fighting is the real deal. They're people that are, are gonna be able to hang with Alliance and Check Mad and all these top teams out there. You know, it's just, it's huge, it's incredible to see. Being able to compete with something that's such a mass, you know, army of uh, like like soldiers is like, you know, it's pretty exciting to to have our little crew be able to come out, you know, wreak havoc on those guys. In the next couple of years, I just I think that we're gonna just completely pass everybody up. You know, we, we're almost winning now with just blue and purple. So once we're blue, purple, brown, and black, I think that's lights out for everybody. They're gonna have to build another mega team all together to be able to compete. Aluminium. It's aluminium. Yeah. Good work. All in, all in day's work. Yeah, we've been on such a long journey, man. When I moved in the gym, I think Heath had literally just gotten his purple belt. So like when we go to the, the worlds and stuff, we weren't even allowed to have him in the coaching area. He'd be like yelling from the stands and stuff. When I was a blue, we had guys go and win the worlds in pans as white belts, and then just kind of as I moved up, you know, they moved up. And once Andrew was purple, we got a nice little group of blue belts, and you know, then the locals started coming in, and you know, just built that up as it went along. You know, we were in this little box, smaller than the box we're in now, underneath a fucking theater, and everyone's in there rolling hard. We're running into the walls and stuff. We just felt like we could kind of beat anyone. You know, and then everyone kind of make fun of us, being they're like, who's the black belt on your team? And I'm like, well, we don't have a black belt. Well, who, who's your coach? And they're like, well, it's, it's that guy, the purple belt over there. And they're like, what the fuck? And then we were like winning the worlds at white belt, and then we won at blue belt and purple belt. So it's like us against the world a little bit. Oh, fuck them. <laughs> Back in the day, no one knew who we were, man. We just kept showing up at the tournaments. We've built the name and the success we've had just through attrition, just from being there constantly, constantly getting on the podium. 
No one used to talk to us, we were, we were nothing. We were just a separate, tiny, small team that no one knew about. And now we're walking around and we're talking to all the black belts, all the top guys, and we're a part of that top tier that is winning everything at the top. It's just, it happened really fast and it's crazy. It's unbelievable, it's, it's really wild. The first major like competition where we got a team trophy was the Atlanta BJJ Pro and they wouldn't let me on the podium to pick it up because they said I wasn't a black belt. So today when I was up there in the same building, I, I thought about that, man, and it's like all the guys come from, you know, such a tiny place, man, and just competing against these huge, like, mega teams where, you know, most of the guys don't even know each other. You know, they never even spoke before, and then they kind of combine all their points, dude. It's, it's, just, it's an incredible feeling being up there with those guys. I couldn't be, like, more, more proud of the performance and the outcome. You don't need to be part of a superstar team to make it work. You just have to have good training partners that want you to succeed, that will push you. You know, there's no secret techniques in jiu-jitsu anymore. It's 2020. You can get the technique. You just need to have the grit and the heart. People don't really understand, you know, what, what, what goes into like, you know, winning. You know, it's like the tip of the iceberg thing. You know, they see the tip, but they don't see the iceberg. You know, the hard work and what you have to put in and everything that you have to give up and the places they're from. I don't know if they ever thought that they would, you know, get, get a chance to be a part of something like this. Sometimes you can't get a mattress every night and if it's a hard night of training and you go to bed, you don't want to be uncomfortable. So if you just sleep on the mat every single night, it's easier, just way easier because you might not always get a bed. <laughs> so over here, it's like Boardwalk and Park Place. This is the barrio. This is where the brown people hang out over here. Yeah, why you brown, bro? So these are like the red ones. And then this over here is like uh, Mediterranean and Baltic Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, you might actually win. Yeah, he is a good guy. Money wise, he may not be rich, but when it comes to friends and relationships and a big family, what he has, I mean, priceless. Those guys up there would do absolutely anything for him. I, th I think it's probably reaching a lot farther than he may even know. Um, just by doing those things and being a coach and, and a mentor. And the thing that I respect the most is people who fight for what they want, man, who struggle, who grind. You know, back then, I got to see just Andrew and, and Bird living in the gym. Now to see really how Heath has opened it up and really helping these other guys, you know, and watching these guys. I mean, you're talking in, in you know, a place in the United States where is it the greatest uh, parts of the world, you know? And he's, he's helping a lot of these guys, man. I mean, he's helped a lot of these guys. And, and to me, there's nothing better than being that kind of man, you know? And that kind of man who helps other people like that, dude. There's nothing better. Let's do it. Get a man. Hey, get a man. This is all you. This is what you've been waiting for. He's, he's been like the ultimate guy for me. And like, he's been like a father figure I never had growing up. Heath is one of those guys, he really does care. Like he cares about these kids, man. He really cares about these kids and that's the difference, you know? A lot of people just kind of tune in, go teach their class, do their thing, check out, whatever. Like Heath is one of those guys who lives it, man. He lives it, he lives it, he lives it. Heath, man, this has got to be amazing for him. He doesn't get anything from the gym money-wise. He doesn't do this for money, you know? He doesn't even like charge the guys that live in the gym anything. So like he doesn't get anything from this except for like the joy of giving people the ability to do their dreams. So I mean, for him, he's gotta be feeling pretty happy. I'm, I'm happy for him. You know, we've been doing this together a long time, man. It's nice to succeed. Watching someone make a dream and accomplish it, you know, and really live it in that moment, it's just a really incredible feeling, you know. Uh, that's what this is all for. You know, the trophies don't mean shit. The medals don't mean shit. But watching someone you know, in a moment like that, that's everything, you know what I mean? That, that, that's the point of doing this every day and, and spending time away from my family and my kids, you know what I mean? And, uh, and spending the money and the time on this is all for those moments, you know, to watch guys like Jacob become something and uh, believe in themselves. And then, you know, one day pay that forward to help somebody that was like them, you know, that's the whole point of all of this. So without that, all this means nothing, you know, it's just results on paper. Oh, 
lot of people ask, man, you know, in such a little town, man, you have all these guys competing at this level, are you surprised? The answer, humbly, is I'm not surprised at all. I've always believed what they tell you about hard work. If you dedicate yourself every day to something and you've truly given everything you can to that, it'll work out, things will work out. And I've always felt like that was gonna happen with this. Best coach in the fucking world, baby. Best coach in the fucking world. No doubt, no doubt, number fucking one. Grave Galatians 317, thou shalt pour thy gravy upon thy biscuit. We're here in Austin, Texas, getting ready for the Who's Number One press conference. This is the biggest card I've ever been on. Gordon Ryan's on the card. Gabby Garcia's on the card. The star of the Daisy Fresh series, Andrew Wilson. Well, Welcome to the Daisy Fresh series.